proud to announce Professor Seard Clothing, which is the president of the, Euro, uh, of the Academy of Europea and also was the former vice president of the European Research Council. Professor Sigur, please. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. Uh, and thank you also very much, President Trezor, for the uh, invitation to be here uh, at this very interesting symposium with very fascinating uh, presentations. In that context, I uh, am extremely pleased to have the opportunity uh, today to share with you some views from Academia Europea on uh, the topic of uh, promoting and spreading research excellence in Europe. Uh, and again, this from the perspectives of Academia Europea. In that context, uh, let me start with a few words about uh, Academia Europea. Founded in 88 in Cambridge as an initiative of a group of scholars that really had a vision. They had a vision that Europe needs an academy, in particular at the time where things were changing in Europe. And it is, of course, that same vision that we share with EURASC because around that time also you were preparing to found your uh, academy. Bottom up, nobody told this scientist to do so, but they felt themselves the need. And I think this is a very important uh, feature. I'm an earth scientist, and in that context, this uh, bottom-up approach is very appealing to me, because that means down to earth. And uh, of course, in that context, as the president of Academia Europea, I fully realized that the strength of our academy is uh, its membership. We have uh, about 3,500 members from all fields of, uh, of science, including the uh, social sciences and humanities. And uh, that makes it not only very interesting in terms of meeting people you otherwise never might meet, but it's also very important when we deal with issues like uh, the science of the future, of the future of science, but also about issues related to the newly implemented scientific advice uh, mechanism of the European Commission, where questions like the one that were dealt with in the previous talks are by their nature interdisciplinary. And that means that no single class of our academy can deal with these things in a standalone way. Well, a few words about the mission statement. I think this type of things are uh, probably very familiar to you. What is, of course, important is how to implement this, uh, this mission and uh, how does it work in, uh, in practice. Well, of course, like every academy, for us it is very important to give credit to outstanding scientists, but also to people that have paved the way to carry out outstanding science. And in that context, we were very happy in our meeting in Budapest in September, also attended by President Trousseau, to uh, give the gold medal to Helga Novotny, uh, former president of the European Research Council, and to give the Erasmus medal to Andre Muscolet, one of the outstanding economists of the, uh, of the world. But it is not only awarding uh, people who we uh, give credit for lifelong contributions. For us, it's also very important to stimulate young scientists. And uh, this is a group of Burgeon Scholars. Burgeon Scholars awarded with a Burgeon Scholarship out of a donation from our first president, Sir Arnold Burgeon. We had a meeting in Budapest in September, and at that occasion, the local community and the local academy selected some of the bright minds, the young minds, uh, from this particular country working in, in Hungary. For us, it is very important to be there where we have the members, and the members are all over Europe. We have our headquarter in London, in this tower at the uh, University of London. Uh, but we have also knowledge hubs in uh, all over Europe. It started with the uh, Academia Europea hub in, uh, in Cardiff, uh, sorry, in Roslau here on the right-hand side. 
That is a hub that is very active also together with the European Research Council uh, on the topic of widening European participation in the ERC schemes, but also a hub that is very active in the context of social sciences and humanities. Another hub is in Barcelona in the Institute of Catalan Studies, and this hub has a regional focus on uh, the Mediterranean area, but also a thematic focus on the life sciences and uh, on uh, uh, informatics. Another hub is here in Bergen, and that hub uh, has a focus on Arctic studies, but also uh, on the Northern Atlantic and, and the Baltic, with a strong focus on energy-related studies. And uh, the latest addition is our hub in Cardiff, which is focusing very much on, uh, on Northwestern Europe and is also the hub where we have based uh, our, uh, our efforts on, uh, in the context of the scientific advice mechanism established by the European uh, Commission. Apart from that, we have quite an active publication activity. Our house journal is the European Review, published by Cambridge University Press, and regularly we bring out uh, thematic volumes coming out from different activities by the classes and by working groups, often sponsored, sponsored by private foundations, such as the Wenner Grand Foundation, the Riksbanken from Sweden, but also foundations such as the Volkswagen uh, Foundation. These, uh, these activities are, of course, very uh, important in terms of engaging uh, the membership, but also bringing people uh, uh, together. And also here, we try to be inclusive. And also in that context, I am very happy that we now see basically a uh, participation of members of your academy and our academy in each other's uh, activities. We have also recently established class awards. This is an example of uh, this uh, uh, initiative, in this case in the life sciences, an award called after a very prominent researcher in uh, symbiosis studies, Adam Kondoroshi from Hungary, both in this case for a young scientist, outstanding young scientist from Romania, and a more senior scientist, in this case, from the UK. And here we see an example of what we do in close cooperation with the professional organizations, in this case, uh, a major organization in the field of, uh, of plant science. In terms of our priorities, I'd like to single out uh, three uh, issues uh, in, this, uh, in this context, the, uh, the synergy with the Young Academy of, uh, of Europe, a very important initiative taken by young scientists themselves. Nobody told them to do so, uh, but again, in a bottom-up way. The synergy with the European Research Council, which is clearly a game-changer in the European research funding landscape with major impact. And I would like to mention here very briefly our role in the newly established scientific advice mechanism uh, established by the European uh, Commission. And I, I'm confident that uh, Professor da Graça Cavallo will speak further uh, on, on that, because that's a very important development. The, uh, the Young Academy of, of Europe is an initiative of a group of uh, starting uh, grantees from the ERC, who felt uh, really not only, let's say, very happy with their grants, but also realized that receiving major grants uh, is also implying uh, basically a responsibility. In this case, taking the future of their generation on their shoulder, again, on the pan-European way. And we were very happy to see that coming off the ground. And this is wide open uh, for uh, future membership by also by non-ESC uh, grant holders. And I think this is a very uh, important development on a full pan-European uh, scale. There are many uh, interactions between our academy and of course the Young Academy, but also uh, between us and the ESC on a personal level. Uh, many of the Scientific Council members are members of Academia Europea, and, uh, of course, uh, we always tell our members 
that if they receive an invitation to serve in an ERC panel, please do so. It is a very important task to the benefit uh, of research and to the benefit of Europe uh, as a whole. We also feel uh, a shared responsibility in widening European participation in instruments such as ESC, realizing that pockets of excellence uh, exist all over Europe and we must unlock them. And again, this is a common responsibility, not only of the senior scientists, but also of the more junior scientists. And of course, it's a major issue uh, that uh, has the full attention of organizations such as the, uh, uh, the ERC. Scientific policy advice is another important development where we really see synergy in an ecosystem where, of course, we have the, uh, the SEM unit of the European Commission. We have the high-level group, uh, and you see on this picture Professor Fortunato, you see in the middle Commissioner Muedas, uh, plus other members of the high-level group, plus the uh, presidents of the academies, which form together the SAPEA Consortium, and SAPEA stands for uh, Scientific Advice for Policy by European Academies, and I think you cannot escape from the impression that this is a fairly uh, happy uh, crowd. And uh, what is important, that uh, the topics come partly from the Commission and the high-level group, but we have also, as a SAPIA consortium, the freedom to propose ourselves topics uh, in a bottom-up way. And uh, I was present uh, recently uh, with uh, uh, Professor De Graza Gavaglio at a meeting uh, for the Food of the Ocean project, uh, which is one of the first bottom-up uh, topics where the experts were sitting together with stakeholders and uh, various organizations. And I think this was a very inspiring uh, process because it's very clear that the scientific community sees this as a, really an opportunity but also as a uh, responsibility. It's a big, big challenge, but I think it is very important that in the world where we live today, that the European Commission cares about science-informed policy uh, advice. That is not the case everywhere. And again, it's uh, an enormous responsibility, and uh, we from Academia Europea feel the need uh, for a strong, inclusive approach, uh, building further the partnership with organizations which are not formally part of the consortium at this moment, but of course where we have a lot of expertise, like in EURASC. And it's very clear that we will hard to uh, make this inclusiveness in the period uh, to come, simply for the sake of the quality of the advice, but also in terms of building bridges inside Europe. I think it is a very important uh, goal uh, of mutual uh, benefit. And of course, here we talk about science for policy, but of course, that has also to do something with policy for, for science. Like the theme of this meeting uh, is about the future of science, but there's also a lot that was discussed here in terms of the science of the future. And here, of course, it is very important that today we have a career ladder in terms of the various grant schemes from the European Commission that was, for example, not existing when I was a PhD uh, student. And uh, I think this is extremely important also in the context of brain circulations. And uh, apart from that, we have cost. Uh, the European Cooperation in Science and Technology, which uh, was founded 45 years ago and is the networking tool in, uh, in Europe that also can help to connect these different schemes and in some cases, like for the ESC, but also in other cases, can act as, as a pre-portal. What is important, of course, that we all realize that in Europe we uh, have a concentration of, of top research uh, uh, in a number of places, and uh, this map gives you an impression about that. And on one hand, let's say that's a natural thing if you want to compete with the best institutions in, in, in the world. At the same time, of course, we realize that there are many pockets of excellence which still have to be unlocked and have to be connected and have to be involved. So there is a huge potential uh, to expand uh, on, uh, on this. And, uh, 
this, of course, is fully realized by the ESC. And uh, in my previous function as vice president of ESC, uh, I have always strongly supported this widening European uh, participation uh, in the context of, uh, of ESC. Uh, this is a, a list, let's say, of identified barriers for newcomers uh, from widening countries to Horizon 2020, basically coming out of a study uh, carried out in, in the Netherlands uh, quite uh, recently. And, uh, well, I, I think you will not be surprised to see uh, a number of these, these items, but of course this is work in progress. And, and again, it's also clear that in addressing these things, Partnership is the, uh, uh, is the key. And this is a slide uh, which I uh, got from the vice president of the ESC in the domain of life sciences, who is the chair of the ESC uh, working group for widening European participation. And uh, in, this, uh, in this slide, prominently cost is, uh, is featuring uh, as, a, as a, an instrument that, that can help for this purpose, apart, of course, from the widening instruments of the uh, Commission uh, it, uh, itself, which include twinning, uh, teaming, and uh, the, the ERA chairs. Let me say a few words about COST. Uh, COST is a, uh, a scheme, intergovernmental scheme, funded by the European uh, uh, Commission, involving currently uh, 45,000 researchers from all over Europe is funding actions, cost actions, which are networks. And uh, these networks are to a large degree interdisciplinary. In, uh, in cost, we have uh, member states, and you see here two different uh, colors, even three different uh, colors. In red one, we have what we call the research intensive uh, countries. In green one, we have the inclusiveness targeted uh, countries, uh, including also the EU 13 member states. And uh, what is important, if you look to this, uh, to this slide, uh, then you see uh, here, of course, in, in dark red, uh, the, the major countries in terms of their representation in cost actions in terms of absolute number of researchers on the left hand side. But on the right-hand side, you see the relative percentage of the research community uh, in the countries in terms of that part of the participation. And here you see uh, that COST is doing quite well in a number uh, of countries which belong to the group of inclusiveness targeted uh, countries. And I think this is a very important realization because here uh, we, we see really a growing participation. This slide here shows you the distribution in terms of, uh, of gender and age of those people that have a uh, leading position in this cost actions. And you see that the empowerment of young researchers is, is quite good. Also the gender balance is actually not bad at all. That, in, uh, that is both the case for the inclusiveness targeted countries uh, and the more research intensive uh, uh, countries. And uh, again, uh, in, in terms of uh, the participation from the inclusiveness targeted countries, uh, in green here, that is growing with, uh, with time. And that is making a very significant part of the, the networking uh, actions by, uh, uh, by cost. Let me uh, share you with you a few quotes from uh, young uh, researchers uh, shown here, uh, including a young researcher from uh, EU13, a relatively young researcher from an SME, and uh, another bright young uh, researcher, uh, uh, also here, uh, in this case a female researcher. All these people experienced that involvement in this networking made the, the difference. And that's also what you can see in this table. This table summarizes the success rates that we get from the inventory of people that have been involved in, uh, in cost actions. And you can see basically that the success rates for getting grants from major follow-up schemes is uh, quite good. It's much higher 
than the average success rates that we normally see reported for the different EU uh, instruments. So it looks like that in terms of its functioning as a pre-portal to this instrument, that cost is not doing that bad. And of course, we try even to do better as formulated in our strategic plan. But it is, again, work in, in progress. But in that context, uh, the feedback that we get from the young researchers, in particular, is, uh, is very positive. Well, let me finish up with here a few remarks about the, uh, the, the synergy between these different schemes in, in the broader era, where, again, partnership is, is key. This uh, applies both to finding uh, expertise for the scientific policy advice mechanism. This uh, applies both for joint efforts for widening European participation in the different uh, research schemes. And of course, it also involves, in all cases, a very close uh, partnership with the, uh, with, with the academies. And you see here different logos on this, uh, on this slide. Let me conclude here by uh, making uh, a few points. It's very clear that over the last few years, we see more and more synergy developing between the different academies. And again, I'm extremely pleased to be here in the beautiful Portuguese Academy again, in, uh, in a meeting organized by our sister academy, EURASC. It's also clear that we see a similar teaming up in the domain of the scientific policy advice. We see an increasing involvement of the, uh, of the young researchers. We see their empowerment going on. And I think it is a very interesting phase now today that we are really gearing up for framework nine. Last week, we had a uh, very inspiring meeting organized by the Estonian presidency of the, uh, of the EU Council, uh, issuing the Tallinn Declaration, uh, which uh, the, uh, the team Research Excellence in, in Europe, Impact and Value for Society, and it's very clear that the topic of your meeting here today is right on spot uh, for that. So again, congratulations uh, with that, and thanks again for your invitation. Your um, talk and, in fact, for the message. The message is that if you, uh, if you are fast, go alone. If you want to go further, come together. And this is what you offer for us. So it's open for, uh, for questions if you want uh, to. Oh. Uh, thank you very much, sir, for this uh, very interesting in, uh, information. So, to make it practical and concrete, okay, as regards the action of your academy, and maybe in relation with the SAPIA system, can you give us examples um, as regards, for instance, the framework program Horizon 2020, that you were able to impact, this is to say about the choices of the theme, etc. Let, let me be uh, clear here. This is uh, science for policy and not, not policy for science. So the questions come from the European uh, Commission and, and the high-level group on issues which are important for the, uh, uh, the people who decide on policy and legislation. And this is concerning uh, issues like cyber security, uh, pesticides. These issues come from the Commission at large but are channeled through Commissioner Moedas to SEM. SEM is the overarching name for the scientific advice mechanism, uh, which has a number of components, including SAPEA, the Consortium of Academies, but of course also the high-level group, uh, of which Professor Fortunato is a prominent member, and the SEM unit uh, it, it, itself. And uh, I'm sure that uh, Professor da Graça Cavallo can tell you more uh, about this because she has been, of course, at the foundation of this uh, uh, initiative. Uh, uh, and again, th this is very important to separate uh, this science for policy from policy for, for science. That's a completely different game. But, however, by the moment scientists are asked 
uh, for input uh, to be considered for policy uh, decisions, where of course also other elements play an important role, uh, but at least to come up with the best they can with, for example, different scenarios that the policy uh, uh, makers can choose of. That is very important be because uh, uh, that is a realization that, uh, that, that science can be a contributor uh, to the uh, well-being of, uh, of mankind. Uh, but it is explicitly not the task of SAPEA, neither some at large, uh, to uh, make statements about what should be in, uh, in, in FP9. That, that's a completely different thing.